Hello to all of you unconventional conventionists. Welcome back to Rocky Talkie. It's a Rocky Horror podcast that talks about anything and everything Rocky Horror related. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And joining us on air this week, we've got Tori from the Tesseract Players of Boston, the Full Body Cast, and the RKO Army. Hi, Tori. Hey, what's going on? Hello. So, Tori, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your time with the Rocky community? I would love to. So, hi, everybody. I'm Tori. I am a complete stage whore, as you can hear, since I'm part of three casts. Uh, <laughs> I am <laughs> I am the creative director at the Tesseract Players, and I perform regularly with FBC and RKO uh, whenever I get a chance to. I've been doing Rocky for about 11 or 12 years now, and yeah, I'm super excited to be on Rocky Talkie. I listen every week because i am a creature of habit so every thursday i listen to rocky talkie and i can't believe i am here thank you guys for inviting me oh that's really cute we're famous aaron yay (laughs) tori thank you so much for joining us today truly we're thrilled that you could be here with us now before we get started with the show we would like to take a moment and ask each other how was your week did you guys do anything fun no (laughs) yeah i my life is pain and misery what's so miserable this week john actually no this week is fine aside from the fact that i think i've gotten like maybe seven or eight hours of sleep throughout the entire span of the week my sleep schedule is like royally fucked up harley and arthur are here which is fun uh, it has nothing to do, I mean, like, it kind of has something to do with Rocky, because they are guesting with us, but they just kind of came down to hang, and it just so happened to be on a Rocky weekend, so we're going to go get some food, and then we're going to go get some food again, it's going to be great, I'm I'm really excited to, to see them, and to actively get to hang out with Arthur, because I feel like he and I always just cross paths, but never actually intersect, so now I got him exactly where I want him. You're going to get that quality time. Damn right I am. Quality. Get it. (laughs) What about you, Aaron? What's going on with you? Oh, I mean, unfortunately, this week, all I've got to say is a bunch of Rocky stuff. I mean, we had a bunch of rehearsals with some people, taught taught some Brad Majors, taught some Frank, taught some Riff. That was as fun as it always is. Um, (laughs) But no, it's great. Uh, Did a bunch of that. Um, Had a lot of work this week. Uh, There was some some big stuff happening at work. So I was stuck glued to my computer for a good part of the week. Um, Other than that, though, you know, just just excited to be here talking with you guys. Tori, what did you get up to this week? Uh, I worked. And then uh, just like you guys, I have Rocky tonight. Uh, Tonight, I'm playing Frankenfurter at the Full Body Cast St. Patrick's Day show. We absolutely love the St. Patrick's Day show at FBC. It gets wild every year. Uh, I'm so excited, and I realize that's Rocky-related, but non-Rocky, I actually just got my absolute favorite Polaroid camera back from being repaired, so I am so excited to start shooting with it and the people i sent it out to did an insane job restoring and replacing the very important things that were broken so i'm excited to have that back to shoot oh yeah i I saw the uh the post you made on social it looked so pretty coming out of its box it like i i did that unboxing video but it was my first time actually opening it so uh it was so gorgeous i paid a little extra to get some clear housing on my flash unit because i am a sucker for any of the like see through clear technology that early 2000s apple aesthetic (laughs) absolutely i couldn't say no and i was already paying a pretty penny to have it fixed so i figured you know what's an extra 50 dollars? very cool all right y'all now that that's out of the way how about we dive into our first segment of the show dun, 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 dun. Do, 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 do. 
First up, get your noisemakers ready for a major rocky milestone. Celebrated riffraff of the stage, Christian Lavercombe has just hit 2,000 performances of the Rocky Horror Show. Christian is a Welsh actor and singer and has been performing in the Rocky Horror Stage Show since 2010. He attended Nalen College and trained at the National Academy of Singing and Dramatic Art in New Zealand before getting his start originally playing Frankenfurter. I mean, I've been performing since 1936, but yeah, sure, I guess 11 years in the game isn't too bad either. My dates might be slightly wrong there. Well, since then, Christian has performed in a multitude of Rocky stage shows, most commonly as Riff Raff. Richard O'Brien has called his performance, quote, fantastically talented. Clearly, he has never seen me play Riff Raff, but that's neither here nor there. Christian's got a pretty girthy Rocky resume. He appeared in the 2010 International Tour. He toured in Australia from 2014 to 2015, performed in UK's 40th anniversary tour, and graced audiences in the South Africa tour just before the Panera Bread sent the world to shit. Now he's back at it again with the 2022 UK World Tour, where he hits this cool as fuck milestone in his Rocky career. But that isn't all. So apart from the Rocky Horror Show, that's right, Aaron, there's a world outside of Rocky Horror, Christian has had leading roles in over 30 professional stage productions. Some highlights from his equally girthy, non-Rocky resume include Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar, Bobby Strong in Urine Town, and Cripple Billy in The Cripple of Inishman. Quite a diverse range he's got there. Right, and as of March 15th, Christian has officially been in 2,000 performances of the Rocky Horror Show. This includes six performances as the narrator, 43 as Frankenfurter, 72 as Brad Majors, and a whopping 1,879 as everyone's favorite handyman, Riff Raff. All right, what do y'all's character breakdowns look like? How many Eddies have you had, Aaron? What about Riffs? Well, I'm going to make up some numbers here because I, I, you know, when I very first started, I created a spreadsheet. Like, this was like the first week I I ever saw Rocky. I created a spreadsheet because I'm a fucking nerd. And for like a good solid six months, I tracked every single show that I went to. Who I performed as, who I went with, like the size of the audience. Meg thinks it's really cute, but it's uh, it's kind of a little sad. But I, I dropped off tracking that. So I don't know. I'd have to do some napkin math here. Let's see. So... We'll call it 15 years or so. There was a period for twice a week. I don't know. It's got to be in in the mid hundreds or so on Eddie and like Scott. Um, Riff's probably a few less than that, but I don't know. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. I've done Frank twice. Uh, I've done everybody at least once, but the vast majority is, is definitely going to be Eddie, Scott, uh, and, and Riff. You haven't done me. Well. Well. (laughs) <laughs> have to add it to my list of to-dos. Yeah. What about you, Tori? What are your numbers looking like? Oh, man. I mean, I'm not going to uh, be able to figure out too many specifics, but in order of characters I've played the most, it probably goes Frankenfurter, then Eddie, then probably Columbia, who I haven't played in a long time, but there were there was a couple year span where I was our cast's only Columbia, so I had to play Columbia every show. Uh, And then probably Magenta, because I've only played Rocky once, Janet two or three times, and then I still need to knock Brad and Riff off my list. And then I'll be the hottest Riff in town, so watch out, John. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) What about you, John? Sure, Jan. Whoa. Whoa. (laughs) Sure, Janet. (laughs) (laughs) damn it janet john what character have you done the most do you think Uh, it's it's probably brad regrettably there there was a time where i was brad for like two years in a row uh every friday and saturday night so most likely brad is probably my most played character 
probably followed up by either Frank or Riff to be my number two. I started out playing Riff a lot, but then after I got added to playing Brad and Frank, we had a lot of Riff Raff, so I didn't really get to play him too much, even though he is my favorite. So um, in that order, probably Brad, Frank, Riff, Rocky, I guess. No, Mm. Brad, Frank, Riff, Trixie. I've done a lot of Trixies. And then probably Rocky. I think the character that I performed the least of is probably Columbia because I just recently got like a full amazing screen accurate Columbia costume. Thanks, Megan Aaron. Aww. I'm a I'm a wedding consultant for hire and <laughs> I take payment in screen accurate Rocky costumes if anybody would like to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke, but it's true. It is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably my breakdown. And then like Eddie, Magenta, Janet, Scott, they're all in some order, kind of like in that lower echelon. But Brad is by far the character that I think I've played the most. Nice. Well, keeping on brand with, uh, you know, going around the circle, in an interview on this record-breaking milestone, Christian said, I've had a reasonably varied career, but Rocky Horror has definitely been the theme of my working life as an actor. I've played a few different roles in the show, but Riff Raff was unexpectedly the perfect fit for me. Now, with 2,000 performances of the show, I've performed with 14 different casts and have spent 18 months of my life rehearsing it full-time. What many people find hard to grasp, including myself, is that my enjoyment and attitude towards working on Rocky Horror has remained the same since the beginning. And, like every Rocky Horror interview ever, the fans were given special attention, with Christian saying... I was a fan of the movie long before I was in the show, and I think Richard O'Brien's performance as Riff Raff is absolute perfection. The Rocky Horror fans have been very kind to me over the years, and I think it's because they recognize that I'm also a fan of the show, and as a result, I treat their much-loved characters with respect. He also talked about the growing sensation of becoming Riff Raff, which I'm sure some of us can relate to. He said, As I get ready for the show, I spend hours a day looking in the mirror as Riff Raff. I certainly don't look at myself that much, so I think my brain now recognizes him more than it does me. It's safe to say that he has become part of my identity, and I can't really remember life without him. He's reached old friend status. Riff Raff is constantly evolving, but it's a little like aging. It occurs in such a way that I never notice it's happening. Jesus Christ, it's like he's turning into Heath Ledger's Joker. Is that better or worse than Riff Raff? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so when asked about the recent challenges with coming back to stage after the Panda Express, Christian responded, The Rocky Horror fans have been incredibly respectful since the tour started back in June. Traditionally, Rocky Horror stage doors are a bustling hive of activity after the show, but throughout the last year, the avid Rocky Horror fans have stayed away to protect the performers and to keep the show running. In the circumstances, we've been very thankful for that, and they have definitely played a big part in Rocky Horror surviving and thriving this past year. Being on tour and performing eight shows a week during a pandemic has definitely been an experience. But aside from the obvious challenges, our audiences have continued to come along and show their support. It's also become obvious that we all now have a refreshed appreciation for what an important part theater plays in all of our lives. That's about it for the interview. Don't forget, for all of our friends across the pond, you can still catch Christian as well as all of his castmates like Ori Aduba as Brad Majors and Stephen Webb as Frankenfurter in the Rocky Horror Stage Show currently on tour across the UK. It's soon to play in Belfast, Poole, Bromley, Aberdeen, Wycombe, Swansea, Liverpool, Richmond, Bristol, Southend, Stoke-on-Trent, Cambridge, Glasgow, Northampton, and Newcastle. Tickets are available via What's On Stage, and as always, the link will be on our show notes. We wish the show and the cast all the best. And to Christian, here's to the next 2,000 shows. Let's do the time warp again! Next up, one of our most beloved movie cast members, and you know Jacob picked this story. That's right, we're talking about Barry Bostwick. Yep, this past March 19th and 20th, Barry Bostwick and Sharon Gless starred in A.R. Gurney's Love Letters at Lynn University in the Keith C. and Elaine Johnson Wold Performing Arts Center. 
From the Boca Observer, Love Letters, quote, follows the friendship between rebellious Melissa Gardner and straight arrow Andrew Makepeace Lad III through their notes, cards, and letters. From childhood to adulthood, the friends share their hopes, dreams, disappointments, and victories through their intimate missives. More than 50 years later, the pair wonder if their bond is more than friendship. Sharon is an American TV star who got her big break in 1975. Through the 80s, she starred as Cagney in Cagney and Lacey, and more recently was on the Showtime series Queer as Folk and Burn Notice. She's also been nominated for 10 Emmys and 7 Golden Globes. She won a Golden Globe in 1986 and Emmys in 1986 and 1987 for Cagney and Lacey, as well as another Golden Globe in 91 for The Trials of Rosie O'Neill. She also received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1995, so Barry's definitely punching up on this matchup. Oddly enough, this won't be Barry's first performance of Love Letters. Back in 2020, he performed it alongside Barbara Eden of I Dream of Jeannie for a touring production. So good on Barry for scoring both a 60s and 70s star to play opposite in Love Letters. All right, so who's he going to get for the next production that's from the 90s? Like, what's the peak 90s star that could play Barry's Will They, Won't They crush? I don't know, John, who do you think? Mm, 90s star that could play Barry's Will They, Won't They co-star. Mm-hmm. How old is Barry right now? Google. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Why can't I think of his last name, Bostwick? There it is. <laughs> he is 77. 77. Okay, let's see. We're going to Google famous women that are in their 60s. <laughs> Let's see. No, no, no. Not from the 60s. Nope, that they gotta are... be a 90s star. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm, I'm trying to... Ooh. What about... Uh, I mean... Uh... Okay. Hear me out, okay? A late 80s star, I think. But I think would probably murder this role, okay? Are y'all sitting down? Mm-hmm. Because you're gonna stand up because this is gonna blow your fucking mind, Okay. Sigourney Weaver. Oh, yes. Ooh. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, like, like I mean, like, yeah, she's known for Ripley and Alien, which was, like, early 80s. But, like, Alien went into the 90s. She was still really relevant then. Oh, yeah. I think Sigourney I... Weaver could... Wait, is Sigourney Weaver taller than Barry? Not that it matters, but, like, here, how tall is Barry <laughs> Bostwick? Oh, no, just kidding. No, he's way taller. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that Barry was that tall. Yeah, he's 6'4". Yeah, and Sigourney Weaver's 5'11". Again, not that it matters, but, you know, the dynamic is there. Also, <laughs> in that relationship, Sigourney Weaver would totally be the top. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something, something laying eggs. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tori, well, who, do you, who do you got for us? Who do you think could be Barry's uh, 90s co-star? All right, I have two that I think could work. So first I'm going to go with Meryl Streep. Oh, yes. You again, know. he would be the bottom. Again, yes. <laughs> Meryl Streep is big top energy. And then my second choice is Shelley Long. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I just always... <laughs> oh, he says I as he who Googles is. who Shelley Long is. <laughs> yes. I, I... I just always oh, think her. of True okay. Beverly Hills and like... I don't know. I th- I think she'd be fun for Barry, but you know, not as Dom as Meryl, but he would still be the bottom. I love how we're shipping <laughs> Barry Bostwick with a bunch of these just like <laughs> older women, and he's always the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, if you if you listen to this, we're not sorry. You know we're right. Speaking of him being the bottom, I I just want to see him play opposite Ellen. I think that that would be like the most Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, yeah. I think, not that I want to give her work, but I think that that would just be, like, uh, the most hateful interaction between the, you know, like, will they, won't they? God, I hope they don't, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I hope they won't. <laughs> I'm well, rooting on the wrong side for, for that uh, interpretation of love letters. Well, if you are listening to this and you are either A, Barry Bostwick, or B, a community member... Please write in and tell us who you ship Barry Bostwick with. You can find our contact on rockytalkypodcast.com.
Wow, that was that was a good little improv there. Yeah. I want to see, I want Barry Boswick to write it. <laughs> well, for only $45, you can have him tell you on Cameo. Okay, I will go and in with Cameo you guys. And Cameo will be like, who would you ship yourself with? He's going to be like, what the fuck does that mean? Do you want my underwear? <laughs> That's an additional $50. <laughs> Well, best of luck, Barry. You go get yourself a nice 90s girl to write some love letters to. And with that, let's move on to our next segment, Community News. <laughs> Come. <laughs> First up in Community News, it seems like Jacob must really be missing Uncle Barry because we're doing another segment, Good Old Bear Bear. Can't say I'm all torn up that we haven't had to cover the asshole for a hot minute. What about y'all? I always miss Uncle Barry. Well, I never miss Uncle Barry because he's always with me in spirit anyway. Well, if you're not a total weirdo and would like some actual Uncle Barry FaceTime, none of this spirit nonsense, we've got some great news. Assuming that you live in or around the Lawton, Oklahoma area, of course. That's right. For one night and one night only, our favorite asshole will be making an appearance at the Apache Casino in Lawton, Oklahoma, as part of his Rocky Horror Picture Show 47th Anniversary Spectacular Tour. On Friday, May 13th at 7.30 p.m., Lawtonese Rocky fans will be granted access to, quote, see the original, unedited movie with a live shadow cast and audience participation, plus a costume contest, and more, end quote. Ooh, unedited, you say? Does that mean it'll have once in a while? Shh, I hear they even left in the Brad Riff buttfuck scene. <gasps> oh! Oh! Mustaz. Well, if you're interested in catching up with Bear Bear, seeing a fantastic performance by a fantastic shadow cast, and possibly even seeing the Brad Riff buttfuck scene, you can get tickets to this spectacular tour stop at ApacheCasinoHotel.com. Tickets will run you between $20 and $40, depending, of course, on how close to Barry you actually want to be. Are they actually going to show the buttfuck scene? No. Are they actually going to play once in a while? Probably not, no. Does Barry know that he can say no to some of these tour stops? I... 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 I don't know. Well, speaking of traveling to weird places for Rocky, did you all see that spicy hot tea that dropped in the Winter Hangout group this past week? Wait, there was spicy hot tea? Oh yeah. A spicy hot pole, in fact. Last Tuesday... Hank Johnson made a post to the group asking about everybody's availability for a Vegas trip. I'll see you next Tuesday, am I right? <laughs> hey, it's your boy, uh, Skinny Penis. God damn it. So Hank was involved with Rhode Island Rocky back in the 80s and 90s, and now he does a lot of event planning for, like, conferences. He made a post to the Winter Hangout group a few weeks back, introducing himself and volunteering as tribute to lend his professional know-how to put together a 2023 hangout in Vegas that's fun and affordable for our community. Also, we should note that his primary day job is teaching public health at a university, so COVID safety would, of course, be on the forefront of his mind while putting this together. It looks like enough interest was piqued about the trip, because last week, Hank made another post letting us know that he's in the scouting and quality control phase of planning this hangout and offered up a poll to the community asking who would definitely, probably, probably not, or not attend a Vegas hangout that would potentially take place from February 2nd through the 5th of next year. As of right now, his numbers are looking pretty good. He's got about 30 answers so far, and it looks like most people are interested in taking the trip. Excellent. I didn't get a chance to make the last Vegas hangout. It looked like everybody had an absolute blast, and I was kind of on the fence about it. Ultimately, though, and like this is no shade whatsoever meant to anyone who helped plan the thing, what kind of pushed me off the fence was the fact that it wasn't held on, you know, the Las Vegas Strip proper. 
Like, I haven't been to Vegas, and I really feel like if I was going to go spend all that money and make the trip, you know, I really wanted the full Vegas experience, and I didn't really want to have to choose between staying on the Strip and staying at the same hotel as, you know, the rest of the Hangout, who I wanted to hang out with. So I'm really looking forward to this one, though. Meg and I have both talked about making it out to Vegas like forever. I I really hope that this one moves forward and is able to take place somewhere, you know, in the middle of the action. What about you guys? Do you think you'll make it out if it happens? I mean, what would you guys be looking for in a Vegas trip? Uh, I mean, I probably won't just because I'm traveling like 8 million times this year anyway and making a lot of large purchases this year. Um... That's fair. That's fair. But if I were to be going, what I would be looking for in a Vegas trip is an evening that leads me to being stranded in the middle of the desert with my arms tied behind my back and a paper bag over my head. Halfway between Vegas and the Bunny Ranch? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's That sounds like a great Vegas trip for me. What about you, Tori? I would like to go out to Vegas for the winter hangout. Uh, Like you, Aaron, I haven't really been out to Vegas and been able to enjoy it. The last time I was there, it was for a music festival, and I was there for the music festival. I was gone. I didn't get to experience anything. So anything that's kind of quintessential Vegas, but, you know, it doesn't have to be like, the most insane things, you know, something that's still affordable for everybody. And I mean, Mm -hmm. John, if you want to be found out like in the middle of the desert, why don't we just have like Rocky Horror Burning Man? I'm game. Let's do it. Nope. (laughs) Hard pass from Aaron. All right. What is a good (laughs) Vegas trip for you then, Aaron? Hookers and blackjack. Okay. But you can do that in the middle of the desert at Rocky Horror Burning Man. I mean, I can do with that at the casino out in Queens. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> right? No. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. Like, it, it, when I go somewhere, like, and this is, like, for any kind of Rocky thing, I always just love to make sure to get to go do the stuff that's around, you know, that you can only do there. So, yes, I'd want to go to all the big casinos. I'd want to, you know, ride the stupid touristy rides that they've got. Mega uh, would not allow me to go to Vegas without a trip to the Bunny Ranch, so that would certainly have to happen. Uh, that'd probably be really awkward, but, you know, I'd, I'd wash it down with a healthy dose of liquor and cocaine back in uh, Las Vegas and you know it sounds like a a party I just I just want a party that's all it really is oh right Meg really wants us to get Vegas married so we'd have to also do that does that mean that you would have to be unmarried and then remarried oh no they'll do it as a second I mean they'll take your money for anything right it's Las Vegas (laughs) okay but is everybody gonna be in costume Oh, there's this place, actually, that does, like, themed weddings, uh, and, like, they usually do it with, like, the Elvis impersonator stuff. One of their packages is actually to have Rocky Horror-themed, where, like, Frank marries you as the minister, and, like, the the flower girl and stuff is dressed in, like, Columbia costumes. Like, don't tell them, but, I mean, they're clearly bag costumes, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Oh, those but, are, that's cute, though. Yeah, it's actually super cute. It, uh... Meg and I might have looked at that uh, before we eventually decided to just go get married at Oakley Court instead. So (laughs) it was definitely on our list. And like that would be one of the things we'd have to go do in Vegas. So from all of us here, we certainly hope that all of Hank's planning comes to fruition and we're able to lose a bunch of money at craps with all of our lovely listeners sometime next winter. (laughs) Craps. And speaking of spending a bunch of money on Rocky... We just talked about some spicy hot tea, and now we're going to talk about a spicy hot tea, a t-shirt, that is. I fucking hate you. You can't say anything that would hurt my feelings. I went to Catholic school, Aaron. Do better. (laughs) T-Villain prides itself on being the most nefarious limited edition t-shirt site on the internet. Every Monday, they feature a new collection of spooky designs from different cult movies and fandoms. How long the designs remain on sale depends on their popularity, but once the run ends, it's done. Finito, gonzo, forever, so. Plus, at midnight, when the darkness swallows the previous day, the site will poffer forth one brand new featured shirt. 
bathed in the ominous glow of the moon. With it, a new timer will begin counting down, destroying all traces of the design once it reaches zero. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. You're getting old, buddy. Yeah. Well, almost forever. The site keeps a gallery of its past shirts, and they let customers know that if they see a design they simply cannot function without, you can get in touch with them, and they can probably make it happen. For a fee, of course. <laughs> this site is pretty great. They've got lots of really cool designs featured right now, like Donnie Darko, Little Shop of Horrors, House of a Thousand Corpses. Oh, and Rocky, of course. There's this one t-shirt they have that it's it says, visit the Castle of Frankenfurter and do the time warp again. And it's in this gorgeous purple and red, and it's reminiscent of those postcards that are out there you know like visit las vegas nevada and it's the curved bold font and then there's a character in each letter and there's the hot janet naked statue on the side with the castle and freaking further with the axe i definitely think i want the shirt yeah i didn't even realize that that's what it was cribbing off of like that totally is what it is it's it's literally like the, the visit uh, Niagara Falls, you know, postcard thing. I love it. So all T-Villain shirts are offered in a pretty wide range of sizes, from extra small all the way up to 5X, as well as a robust variety of styles, including long sleeve, tank tops, and even some button downs. Aaron? Yes? Did you buy a Rocky button down? I, I, I might have. Do you need... More button downs? Well, kind of. Do you need more Rocky shirts? Well, kind of. Young man, I work very hard to put food on the table for this family. Yes, sir. Well, if you need a new Rocky shirt, definitely check out this design on T Villain. It's super cute, it's got a naked lady on it. And because it's limited edition, you're almost sure to not have any awkward run-ins at a convention where you and someone else are trying to rock the same t-shirt and one of you has to go back upstairs and change. Or maybe you will meet someone with the same super exclusive shirt and scream, oh my god, twinning at each other and take a million selfies together. Then you've got yourself a best friend for life. I mean, this just sounds like a win-win to me. So head on over to tvillain.com to check it out and maybe find yourself a best friend. We'll link that for you in our show notes. We got you. And with that, I think it's time for... Tax snack. Yep. Tori asks a question. I know how this bit goes now. Did you learn to read? No, we've just done this 68 times. I think I figured out the formula by now. I am just so honored to be your 69th snack. It's delicious. You're delicious. Thank you for letting us have you. John, phrasing. I said what I said. <laughs> nice. So, okay. You guys certainly remember, about six months ago, there was a little thing called the Tesseract Staycation Convention. Never heard of it. That's, that's a shame, John. You were in it. You should probably see a doctor. That tracks. And one of the panels for that con was about using skills from Rocky Horror in real life. And if anybody wants to see these, we do have recordings we can share. But we had incredible people talking on the panel. Like we had Ruth Finkwinter and we had Mix Universe and Sam the Hobo from the JCCP and myself and Harley was on it as well. It was our last one of the weekend and we had the most and I I went into the panel thinking it would go one way and all of the information that people had to share about the different skills from Rocky in their life was really eye opening. But the biggest takeaway from the panel was that if you're looking to learn a skill, no matter what it is, Someone out there in the community is most definitely an expert, be it sewing or art or underwater basket weaving or 
milk Polaroids. Yeah. Milk Polaroid me, daddy. I love that panel. Like, I, I thought there were some really great insights from the community there. So today, I'd love to talk about what I do, you know, when I'm not running around in fishnets and heels. Or organizing a convention, or running a cast, or directing other shadow casts, or... I... I do a lot of Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> Tori said doo-doo. But when I'm not doing all of those things, I am a professional photographer, and for the past seven years now, I have worked with this great New England company called Newberry Comics, and... I started off as a photographer for them when they first hired me, and now I have kind of turned into the self-proclaimed marketing wizard where I send out newsletters and I run social media and just kind of do all of our communicating with our customers. Uh, Aaron, I'm sure you're familiar with Newberry. We've done... We've done a number of vinyl pressings of the Rocky Horror Picture Show album on clear and color splattered vinyl over the last few years. Oh, yes, I absolutely picked up a few of those. I used to have this whole wall of Rocky records in our house back before we moved back to the city. And the Newberry records were just some of my favorite ones to put up there. So a lot of my job involves marketing. And let me tell you, marketing now is so different from marketing throughout the history of Rocky Horror. So let's talk about that. Rocky is pretty much the quintessential example of viral marketing before anyone even coined the phrase. And it did it all without the huge reach that the internet provides. I mean, it's so true. Y you know where we're going to start back at the original Rocky Horror stage show. Oh, I love this part. Shut up, John, or we'll talk about shock treatment and Phantom of the Paradise. I have a feeling we're going to talk about those both anyway, but... I can't get a break. All right, where are we going? The theater upstairs, the Chelsea Classic, the King's Road, which of the original originals is where they really started to promote the original stage show. Originally. <laughs> <laughs> well, originally, it, it's definitely the Chelsea Classic. Uh... That's where the production team realized they had a hit, and they just started promoting the crap out of the stage show. So the classic, for anyone out there that doesn't know, was the second theater that Rocky was performed in. It transferred there in August of 1973. The stage show had only been at the theater upstairs for two months during its initial run, and it would again move to the King's Road Theater three months later, as the classic had been scheduled for demolition. In Rainer Burton's The Rocky Horror Show, as I remember it, he recalls the opening night at the Classic. Arriving back at the Classic for the performance, I was amazed to see two World War II arc lights positioned across the road, crisscrossing their extremely bright beams of light into the sky, and a red carpet stretching from the curb into the foyer, either side of which were two gorgeous blonde model girls. They were dressed in extremely short, white, flimsy skirts and tops, wearing blue pillar box hats and light blue jackets, giving them the appearance of 50s American candy box usherettes. This was a deliberate attempt by the marketing people to give the impression a major film premiere was just about to take place. Fun fact, later that night, as the after party for opening night wound down, Michael White had been cheap, so they held it in the theater. Rainer remembered spotting one of the candy girls from the front of the house sitting alone in the stalls, smiling at him. He recalled, I just had to go over and chat with her. She was welcoming and looked very sexy. I thought I was so cool in my approach to chatting her up when out of the blue she asked, were you nervous tonight? No, that's my character. Rocky, he's nervous. He's just been born. I know that, but you looked nervous. Momentarily, she had deflated my ego, dented my confidence, and burst my bubble. But then she leaned forward and just before kissing me full on the lips, whispered, never mind, you can take me home if you'd like. Nice. So, uh... So did he take her home? No. That's a shame. They actually went to her place. Nice. And the next morning, they were awoken by one of her fabulously gay roommates bursting into the bedroom to tell her that she had missed the orgy the night before. Nice. Uh, if I had a nickel for every gay orgy that I've missed. 
After that opening night, and apparently the night some random dude had a huge orgy, Rocky was the hottest ticket in town. The two are not related. I disagree. But the show was so hot that everyone who worked on the West End was clamoring to get tickets. They obviously couldn't go to the regular performances, working their own shows. So the producer scheduled a special midnight matinee exclusive for the West End community. They knew that an exclusive celebrity-filled event would amplify the already substantial buzz around the show. Rayner recalled that everyone, from leading artists to understudies, were there. Two of the biggest stars in attendance were Angela Lansbury and Lauren Bacall, two huge Hollywood stars. Lauren, of course, the widow of Humphrey Bogart, both were in town appearing in West End shows and attended the first midnight Rocky Horror matinee. It was so successful that they scheduled a second midnight matinee. This time, the box office vetted the celeb purchasers, attempting to verify that they were only sold to people who had not seen the show before. To call that marketing success would be an understatement, but it's not exactly all that hard to promote a hit. Just get the hottest stars on the West End and have them show up at your critically acclaimed production, have everyone write amazing reviews, release a sold-out cast recording album. It's so simple, why don't we all just do that? Right. But for as successful as the stage show was, oh, the movie was a whole different matter. It was really clear from the get-go that Fox had no idea what to do with the Rocky Horror Picture Show film. Executives had already been wary. In 1974, Fox had released Phantom of the Paradise, a film that appeared to ooze with cult appeal, but failed to produce results. Reportedly, the senior management at Fox had even tried to stop production of the film, but Jim Sharman was committed to push the movie over the finish line, even though it was already a quarter million dollars over budget. And when they did release Rocky, Fox promoted it with a mismatch of indecisive marketing materials. There was the press kit that was published, but it was basically the industry standard with accompanying photos, background information, the logo, nothing unusual there. Critics were baffled by the film. It made little sense that Fox had tried to release Rocky as a mass market movie, when many thought it would have been a shoo-in for the late night B-movie Midnight Circuit. And speaking of bees, what was even more baffling was the B-style movie poster. Yes, this is the yellow one with Frank on the throne and the kick line of fishnets with the he is the hero, yes the hero slogan, completely out of touch with the film. And as we all know, Rocky flopped on release pretty much everywhere except a handful of locations, particularly like L.A. After the failed launch, Fox temporarily tried to run Rocky on the drive-in movie circuit as a double feature with Phantom of the Paradise. Which, like, good idea. But nobody was going to see Phantom anyway. Everyone knows the main reason you go to a drive-in is to watch some quality films. That's why I go. It wasn't until Rocky was brought to the midnight movie circuit that Fox found its marketing footing. You have the different set of Jaws lip poster spoofing on Steven Spielberg's summer blockbuster. The official film trailer also leaned into Rocky's weird side. It featured the lips telling audiences that you've seen all kinds of movies, but you've never seen anything like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It had the time warp, it used the different set of Jaws slogan, it sounded weird, it looked weird, and it oozed Rocky. I'm really excited for Tim Deacon's book. If it lives up to my expectations, I'm guessing we're going to find out a lot more details about this whole period. The internal studio conversations, and maybe even what other crazy ideas the studio had considered before bringing Rocky to the midnight circuit. And Fox now found itself in that inevitable position of getting to promote a hit, or at least an underground hit, which is probably even better, though Rocky still wasn't invincible. The failed 1975 Broadway show, for among many other reasons, failed because it promised too much with its marketing. Lou Adler took out a full-page ad in the New York Times saying, Give our regards to Broadway and tell them we're on our way. Rocky. It also boasted that the show was acclaimed on two continents. Which, if you've ever met a professional Broadway critic, which I have not, I assume that they would just put on their sensible shoes and declare, Challenge accepted! With Broadway a flop, 
the movie Not Yet a Sensation, and the original stage show long since having rotated cast members, a lot of the original actors found themselves able to branch out beyond Rocky, but like with any hit, they couldn't quite escape Rocky's orbit. Tim Curry released his first solo album in 1978. Read My Lips was an obviously nod to Rocky, with the back cover even featuring Tim on a background that totally isn't Frank's lab coat. On tour, Tim often concluded performances with a live version of I'm Going Home. If you got it, use it, you know? Speaking of, Slow Gin, one of the songs on Read My Lips, has a chorus where Tim repeats the phrase, I'm so fucking lonely, over and over which hilariously allowed the record company's marketing department to put a warning sticker on the album's front cover that said, Dear Programmer, the songs Slogan and Allen each contain one of the seven dirty words and are not suitable for airplay, which is just a wonderful bit of foreshadowing for the parental advisory stickers that adorned records, cassettes, and CDs after the RIAA made them compulsory in 1985. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Nice. And if you are Blink-182, fart, turd, and twat. (laughs) Nice. God damn it, John! What? It said there were seven. I had to go see what the other six were. Just slap one of those parental advisory things on this episode. Or don't, because it's a podcast, and no god can censor me. Okay, so while John sits in potty mouth timeout, Tori, let's talk about that. Give us some eyes into that process. If you're promoting a mass market Rocky product, something like the Newbery Comics soundtrack release, something like a Tim album, what are you looking to do to appeal to both the community and to the wider non-cult obsessed audience? I mean, if Tim Curry says fuck, I guess it sells, but like we can't all be that lucky. We're all lucky. Uh, sorry, I I couldn't. I'm leaving. <laughs> nah, that's fair. That's fair. That's fine. Can we get a? Can we just get Shadow Earth Cobweb on the call? But anyway, yeah, <laughs> when you're promoting a mass market product, it has to be something that kind of already has a similar cult-ish following. So, like with the Newberry Comics vinyl releases you know we press those in different colors and they're in limited editions and there's already a huge vinyl community out there which is just as wild as the rocky community because i'll go on the reddit forms at work to see you know people are upset that something sold out too fast or the you know reddit boards are wild but the key is to make something that's rocky that appeals to you know, the larger audience, but, you know, you, so you get people that are invested in those other items, but you're also getting the Rocky Horror community by default because it's Rocky, you know? Makes sense. Yeah, totally. But there's always some unexpected angle you can find to promote something. Just look at stuff like the Pet Rock or My Little Pony, or I don't know if you guys get these sponsored ads, but I get croc sponsored ads for editions that are like lucky charms or (laughs) uh there was a pair of like kfc crocs that have like a literal fried chicken thing on top of it like if there's a (laughs) if there's a brand out there and you can like slap a license on it you know why not i would much rather get those targeted ads the only targeted ads that i get are ads for like mattresses and blankets and rugs that show women's bare feet in them and then all the comments are just people in all caps saying feet located you guys don't get them diabetes ads i don't have a foot fetish (laughs) we're not here and it's like if you're listening to this and you have a foot fetish i'm not i'm not kink shaming you at all like rock on it's just not my thing but we if you want we can switch targeted ads (laughs) Just hit think... me up. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at hi John I'm Dad. J O N. I really don't want my targeted ads anymore. There's too much feet. Is there like some kind of branded object that you guys would absolutely like have to buy, no matter how ridiculous it was, if it was Rocky related, like Crocs or something? 
Like, mm. like, would you wear Rocky Horror Crocs if they had like little lip giblets and like boobies or something and like had a fishnet pattern on them? I mean, I'll wear Crocs regardless. That don't bother me. I'm fine with that. Yeah, and I'm I'm one of those guys that'll buy almost anything if it's cute and it's got something related to Rocky on it. I mean, I, I skip out on a lot of like the socks and, you know, the, the that kind of stuff. Although I think I did just buy a pair of Rocky socks recently. Yeah. No, yeah, you can put the lips on anything and I'll just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the like better examples of more recent Rocky marketing to the mass market was that Matt Cosmetics line that they did a couple years ago you know because oh yeah Mm -hmm. people there's already the huge makeup community and us folks in rocky horror need a lot of makeup so like you said if there's a pair of lips on it you know we're gonna buy it so that's another example of like it's another example of a product that appeals to the greater community but it definitely gets the rocky community Oh, yeah. I mean, just a couple weeks we did that uh, Snag Tights did that line of Rocky Tights and Fishnets and stuff. And like knowing that they specifically had the community in mind definitely sent me over the edge to go buy a couple of those. Like that that was great branding on their part. Yeah, I absolutely bought a couple pairs and I am waiting for mine to come in. Uh, But when you have something that sells itself, it certainly becomes a lot less complex to market. And I mean, that was kind of what led to the out of control monster that the stage show became in the 80s through into the 90s. The interactive nature made it just so much easier to self promote, but it definitely kind of led to feeding into its own self image. It became a campier party piece. The audience was rowdy. The show's narrator was often played by an inexperienced C-list celebrity that had very little acting chops. And at the end, the actors just kind of struggled to keep control of the whole show. But if you were promoting Rocky, boy, was 1980 a good year because that's when fame came out. And boy, did fame make Rocky look fucking awesome. Nice. Oh yeah, just get your show featured in a big budget Hollywood movie. It's so simple. And I mean, with the success of the stage show and the movie on a meteoric rise in the pop culture consciousness, Fox had everything they needed when they produced Shock Treatment just a year later. An already captivated audience of diehard fans, several of the original cast members, the director, art designer, the composer from Rocky... And yet, and yet, they made Shock Treatment. And when they went to promote Shock Treatment, they really marketed it heavily to the Rocky community. There was a TV special, The Rocky Horror Treatment, hosted by Sal Piro, with a behind-the-scenes look at the film and as a love letter to the fan community. Fox also partnered to do a number of fan collectibles, These are things like posters and flyers and buttons and bumper stickers. You guys might know that creepy cereal box style, like paper mask with Richard's head. But overall, they were just really hoping to appeal to the Rocky Horror fan community. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the original studio notes for the Rocky Horror shows His Heels. These notes in the film cover of the unfinished sequel where Richard had originally written several of the songs that ended up in shock treatment. These include Breaking Out, Little Black Dress, Looking for Trade, and I Want to Be an Ace. In shock treatment, Looking at an Ace, which I would know if I'd ever seen it. The studio executive reviewing the Rocky Horror Show's His Heels draft summarized the piece with this. There is a modest but loyal audience for this film, and the first draft shows enough promise though little polish as yet, to make the project worth pursuing. Rocky Horror Shows His Heels, of course, was never made, but morphed instead into shock treatment through several rewrites and honestly just a bunch of production challenges. Shock treatment was given a limited general release, And in their attempt to set fans' expectations, the famous it's not a sequel, not a prequel, but an equal campaign really pushed the narrative that Fox still wanted to manufacture another cult hit. Not to mention, it's fucking shock treatment. Go sit back in timeout.
with a horse and your mother up my with a colander. In shock treatment would eventually find limited success. A subset of the Rocky community really embraced the film. Several regular shadow casts performed throughout the 80s. And the movie still makes an appearance at every convention, and plenty of performances crop up several times a year. The real failure, at least from a marketing perspective, was in hoping that Rocky fans might expand their midnight shenanigans at the will of the studio marketing department. That flies directly in the face of Rocky's entire rock and roll attitude. But don't think that that has stopped studios from trying to manufacture cult films long after Rocky and Shocky. I mean, Repo is probably the most successful, the original promotion for that film really tried to play into the shadow casting angle, with a repo road tour on its initial release featuring the cast and the crew. At least that one caught on. Not like Rocky, but better than a lot of the others. There are several repo casts around the country, and the community even performs it at most conventions. But even as recently as 2017, we've had studios try to do cult tie-ins for upcoming releases. Our old theater in New York ran trailers before Rocky for Anna and the Apocalypse back when it was getting released. That one didn't get any traction. So, Tori, I'm curious about this one. Over at Tesseract, you guys do a lot of non-Rocky shows. What do you find works when promoting shows that, yeah, Rocky people are interested in, but could also have a much broader appeal? So, when it comes to promoting the non-Rocky shows, I think it's definitely important that, you know, you promote your flyers and you make sure the audience knows when they can see the show, but it's helpful to include kind of like a movie trailer for the show that they're about to see. You know, at Tesseract, we, of course, do Rocky, but we also do Buffy Once More with Feeling and Dr. Horrible pretty regularly. We've also done The Princess Bride for a number of years, which is pretty fun. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of roles. But the show, what we were able to do with it, it turned into a really great interactive experience, like how we went about them. Like, you know, how The Princess Bride opens and it's the grandfather reading to the son. Yeah. So we cast the grandpa and then they treat the audience like the grandson. And we'll do a lot of like breaking the fourth wall where every time the kid interrupts the story, you know, the actors on stage kind of like, like, what the fuck, man? Or what the heck, <laughs> you know? When you're approaching a new show that isn't Rocky, if it's especially one that no one's done, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. But aside from those, we also did a run of Grease once, which I personally wasn't involved with. But we also did The Nightmare Before Christmas a couple times, which was a lot of fun. So when it comes to stuff like that for The Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, we did those shows in December. So it, I think we only did them two years, but they were always December shows or we did them one of our regular conventions called Aresia, which happens every January. And Aresia is also where we do Buffy and Dr. Horrible and all of our extra shows. So promoting to that audience for us is pretty easy because the Aresia audience loves Tesseract and they love Rocky and our shows are always full. But when it comes to doing those shows in other locations where we don't have the people who know what's about to happen. If you do them in places like bars or something where you can, especially with Buffy and Dr. Horrible, where it's only a 45 minute show, that's really appealing because, you know, it's only an hour at a bar or something, you know, you can just kind of watch it and then go back to drinking and doing stuff like Tesseract was approached over the summer and we unfortunately had to decline it, but someone wanted to do Princess Bride at this gorgeous castle that was literally on a hill with like the ocean oh, underneath. So neat. I mean, yeah, those those are great tips. Yeah, you know, find find the audience, find find the venue, make it something unique, all that stuff. Yeah, like um kinda how have you guys seen you can watch Jaws like in the water someplace in Texas? 
Like, uh-huh. if you can kind of create that kind of, like, more of a unique experience, I think that definitely also helps draw people into the non-Rocky shows. But at the end of the day, just like with Tim before and Shock Treatment, you can't really ignore the fact that a lot of your audience is going to overlap with Rocky Horror fans. And the stage show certainly acknowledged that just advertising to the already enfranchised crowd wasn't enough. It has rebranded itself multiple times over the years with varying degrees of success. From the 1990 West End revival, it was decided that Michael English's instantly recognizable Columbia head logo would be retired in favor of a fresh promotional campaign featuring pop art comic images of the main characters. And along with the new look was a new name, Richard O'Brien's Rocky Horror Show. Which certainly upset a lot of the collaborators on the original stage show, including designer Brian Thompson, who famously commented on the new title, Richard O'Brien's Rocky Horror Show? Give me a break. In 1992, the Australian production rebranded as the new Rocky Horror Show. There was a bit of an ironic counterpoint to the branding of the 1980 U.S. tour that billed the show as the original Rocky Horror Show. In 2000, for the Broadway revival, the marketing uniquely embraced the film's cult following. A smart move considering the movie had always been more popular than the stage show in the States. Press ads teased audiences with slogans like, you're all virgins to us, and you haven't seen it until you've seen it live. Across the pond in 2003 for the stage show's 30th anniversary, the show was billed as an over-the-top party. They had a nightclub sponsorship and they took full advantage, resulting in the tour feeling a lot more like the 80s incarnation, more than the modern takes that walk the line between being a big budget musical yet still embracing audience participation. And it's around that era, the early to mid-2000s, that the methods of marketing Rocky start to look a lot more like what we're familiar with today. Lots of social media, lots of pictures and video, constant engagement, and so on. I always look to the 2016 remake as a great example of how Fox thinks when they aggressively market Rocky Horror. They had TV tie-ins and tons of videos on social media about the costumes and interviews with the actors. Mick Rock was on set to photograph the whole thing. They even sent out prop kits and had a big Hollywood premiere. If we want a preview of what the 50th has in store, I'd take a good look at the attention that the remake received from Fox. Well, that got dark. I mean, honestly, I don't think so. I would contend that Fox didn't do all that bad with the remake, at least not from a marketing perspective. They got a massive audience, they got a lot of press, and they got a ton of community involvement. Well at least up until we all watched the thing. But at that point, I mean, the marketing folks had done their job. What do you think, Tori? What's your favorite official Rocky promotion? Could be old, could be new, stage show, movie, whatever. What is your favorite bit of Rocky propaganda? I'd have to say my favorite bit of Rocky propaganda, you know, I think would be kind of what you guys talked about on last week's episode with Harley, the iconic Columbia rebranding that they did, because, you Mm. know, it's so iconic. And no matter what language it's in or promoted, like if you see a Rocky Horror poster with that Columbia face on it, you know exactly what that poster says without having to understand the language that's on it. That's a great example. Yeah. As far as like other more like tangible promotions, Whatever anniversary it was where you got the DVD, like, with the gloves and the little, like, shit bag, I thought that was a super cute way to, you know, introduce the rest of the world that doesn't necessarily understand or know what goes on at a show. It's like, hey, here's all this stuff. And then you're sitting at home and you're like, why do I have a pair of pink gloves? And, (laughs) (laughs) you know, do I have to wash this or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the first time they did that was like a VHS release where they bundled it, and it was really weird. If you'd never, if you had no idea, you're just like, "There's a little bag of rice in with my cassette. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Do I cook it? Do I like? 
oh god you know somebody <laughs> did right somebody in their house just was like oh well i cooked some rice it came with my rocky horror video okay but what if someone came to a show to throw cooked rice instead oh, of no. dry rice that has oh. never happened to me but i it has to have it has to very <laughs> slushy Oh, oh dear Just God! Snowballs no. of rice. Uh, no, and then they explode. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, John. <laughs> John, fair's fair. Can you even name a single Rocky marketing campaign? Well, that's not very nice. <laughs> Sitting here acting like I don't know anything about Rocky. I mean, you're right, but damn. No, I think one of my favorite Rocky marketing campaigns, schemes, designs is because here I really like minimalistic designs, which is funny because every single time I play like any video game that has any level of design, I have to maximize it because I, I have to fill everything, you know, but I think my favorite design that I think has ever come out through just Rocky is one of the older posters for the movie and it's just the lips it says the rocky horror picture show and then on the bottom it says a different set of jaws mm -hmm. Absolutely. i love that tagline so much and i wish that they ran with it more because it's short it's catchy it nails exactly what rocky is about it's provocative like but it doesn't give so much away that you know exactly what the experience is going to be I love it. I absolutely love it. It is one of my favorite pieces of advertising that I think I have ever seen. I'm there with you because, you know, everybody recognizes that poster. Everybody knows it. I think I've even read somewhere that Lou Adler is actually credited with the one coming up with that specific slogan, which is just, all right, good job, Lou. Uh, but... I mean, it just hit at such a right time, right? Like, it, they started using it in 1975. That was the year that Jaws came out. It was already a huge blockbuster. Like, it was. it's such a good tagline. All right. And now I'm sure that Aaron has some obscure, stupid bullshit. So, go on. Okay. Yes, this is obscure, stupid bullshit. But I think one of my favorite, like, marketing tie-ins that they ever did was... Um, had to have been about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, they did a tie-in with Budweiser. And they had all of these flag banners, you know, that they sent around to all of these grocery stores. And you would just go to the grocery store and there'd, there'd be the big tower of Budweiser, you know, uh, uh, cans. And it would just be completely Rocky branded all over it. Was it a great campaign? I don't no, but like it certainly put Rocky in front of a bunch of faces that would just never see it otherwise, right? Like everyone goes to the grocery store, everyone probably wanders past the beer aisle, like, and you just had Rocky Horror just everywhere during that Halloween. I think that was a great campaign. Uh, I personally really like the, the, branding that they did on it they also did a bunch of like little bar standees that got sent out to bars uh that was promoting rocky so you'd have like just a little you know like a little uh promo sitting on the bar that talked about rocky you know and budweiser of course i i thought that was great i it, it certainly was one of those like big mass market things that i thought was a really clever idea and i'm hoping that's the kind of stuff that we see a lot more you know as the 50th rolls around some of these big brands getting into like let's do crossovers let's tie into rocky and get this in front of the faces of a bunch of people who otherwise wouldn't be aware of the film well i don't know about any of that <laughs> i think everyone out there knows what's left let's take a look at the community frankly in my accurate and completely true opinion we're fucking crazy today Almost every cast has their resident social media manager. We're all taking photos and posting the videos to Instagram and TikTok, promoting a show or a con. Today is miles beyond photocopying a couple of flyers and calling up your local radio station. So, Tori, this is literally your wheelhouse. You ran an entire online convention for the community. You run the RKOCon social media. In addition to everything you do for the Tesseract Players of Boston and FBC, what are the trends that you see today within the community? And what are some tips for everyone out there who might be doing promotions for their cast? So marketing 
and design and photography and all of this, I could literally talk about all day. So I will try to keep it brief. When it comes to promoting a lot, you know, like everything, branding is pretty key. So if your cast has certain colors, you know, incorporating that stuff into all of your marketing any way you can kind of coins it as your cast. And a lot of what people are doing today and trends I've been seeing is like we're kind of in the shitpost era of marketing when you think about Uh it because you know memes are hitting everywhere you know that's essentially what tiktok is right that's what like the incredible people at rhps buffalo do with tiktok they take these trends and they rockify them you know that's kind of like what i do at work you know if there's You know, if there's someone, if there's a famous artist's birthday, do we have a record I can post about and, you know, kind of bring it up that way? One of the big key points in marketing is definitely timing. But the shit posting, you know, if you can turn it into a meme, people want to share those memes. And if you make a really good meme about Rocky and then the caption is like, Tesseract Players of Boston, June 25th in Salem, you know, when that meme gets shared 50 times, that's 50 promotional posts for my show without, you know, having to do much work. Even, you know, big companies, if you look at TikTok, they're, it's very hello fellow kids, but you know, it works Mm -hmm. because people like it and they share it. Oh, yeah, totally. I know that lots of casts have been really leaning into that. I know um, JCCP just is cranking out meme related content. You know, if there if there is a hot meme on the Internet, they've got a Rocky fied version of it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you can always count on somebody in the community to create the meme for it. We love we love shit posting here. It's it's what keeps us alive in the Panera Bread. You know, one of the bigger trends right now, all of social media especially Instagram and our platforms, you know, everything that's under meta, everything's kind of going more towards video promotion these days. So, Mm -hmm. you know, videos are getting shared a lot more and we have TikTok to thank for that. I, I'm pretty sure for the majority of it because, you know, TikTok happened and now there's Instagram reels and, you know, I've been doing this kind of experiment at work where I'll make a post about I'll I'll make a post about something and then I'll share a reel of that same thing and it usually gets more engagement and you have to kind of cater to the social media gods to get in people's algorithms Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, you even see YouTube doing this, right? With YouTube shorts, they're pushing them really hard now. Instagram, like, added the short form video previews that, like, to go to the Instagram full length videos. Like, everybody is pushing video because it's just so mo- it, it, it It gets so many more eyeballs, you know? Oh, for sure. And with something like Rocky, you know, video is something really easy to be captured and shared because... We do have so many great outlets like Instagram and TikTok. And if you're lucky enough to have the spare person on your cast, if you can schedule someone to post on Instagram stories or take photos so that you can share later, anything you can do to constantly be engaged with your audience is always going to help. And here we are doing a podcast. Hey, that's engagement with our (laughs) listeners. (laughs) I know over here in New York, it's at like at least a three person job, often even more. Meg and Aaron do a lot of the promotional materials because they have the time to do it. And I fucking don't. I used to do it, but I I ain't got no time to make flyers and promos anymore. I've done a few, like I said, in the past, and I often manage our social accounts. And at the show, we're always grabbing cast members who aren't performing to take photos and do live posts. I think one of my favorite things that we do that I don't think I've seen another cast do until us is we actually have highlight reels on our Instagram of all of our active cast members. And every single time we have like a a live video that is like taken and put it on our Instagram story after the show, I'll go through them and I'll actually save them 
into their little individual Instagram reel so that when people want to get a taste of what the show is about and, you know, there's somebody who's on the cast who's telling them about it, they can be like, oh, you know, go to the Instagram and you can find my little highlight reel and you can watch a little bit of the show from the characters that I play. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an absolutely great method of, you know, not only engaging with the wider show with your audience, but a lot of the times people come to Rocky and they're like, oh, I love that Columbia. I love that Magenta. I, you know, I, who's that Frank? Do they also do drag? Do they do who? who is that person? You know, and that's that's a fantastic way to engage. It's the same reason that, you know, a lot of casts will on their website do cast bios um, and that kind of thing. <laughs> Which is we the, need to update. <laughs> yeah, that's uh Give, I don't, I don't give me access to it again. I'll do it for you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> One less thing for me to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've been focusing a lot on, you know, um, making what Tori was talking about, making our branding consistent across our shows, um, using our logo in like the best light as possible to make sure that like everybody recognizes it and it's iconic. And we've been doing a lot of video. We're, um, we're promoting one of our upcoming shows with some video content, um, looking into doing some more short form stuff with it. It's, it, it's the trend. It's what you got to do to, to get those eyeballs on it. And I think that that's um, the direction that a lot of casts are doing, you know, moving forward. I think the long and short of it, it's a lot of work. And there are a ton of fantastic members in the community out there putting their heart and soul into making sure everybody knows about their local cast. And on that note, what do you guys think is substantially different about promoting to the Rocky community versus the broader world, the audience, right? Fox always knows that they can make a quick buck by slapping a new cover on the Blu-ray, but what can community members do to make something appealing to the already diehard fans? So when it comes to the already diehard fans, I think obviously you have to go in the opposite direction of the more broad lips appeal that you try to get when you're talking to everybody that's not the Rocky community. And I think a lot of that comes more from all the great artists and creators in the community, which, you know, kind of is nice because then, you know, you have to be, if you know, you know, you have to know who to talk to to get this really cool pin or this really cool art print, you know? Oh, for sure. Uh, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think another great way to market to the already diet hard fans is to straight up ask them because, you know, when it came to RKOCon and we were trying to figure out that pin, you know, we had, we pulled the cast to see what folks wanted. And, you know, just like Rocky as a whole, <laughs> whole. Nice. <laughs> You know, with Rocky as a whole, it's a very welcoming, community-driven thing. So why not have the people who love it the most have a say in what can be done or made? Absolutely. I think that that's, like, one of the most important things. Finding out what the community wants and delivering on those expectations or creating something that is just so unusual or so like I didn't know I wanted that but I definitely do want that now that I hear about it you know this is kind of the whole thing with like uncons right like they're a unique experience that's crafted for the community by the community like they did one on a cruise ship or like in Las Vegas like we were talking about or out in LA where you can go to Disneyland like there's all these kind of things that aren't necessarily like directly about Rocky, but you can just knowing that you're already talking to a Rocky audience, you, you can kind of go outside of the normal wheelhouse and kind of advertise or market or just craft these kind of events or products specifically for something that like, you know, community members are going to be like, oh, yes, I can go and put on fishnets and I can also go ride the Tilt-A-Whirl, like, you know, that kind of thing that, you know, give them something that they haven't been able to do before. John, what do you think? I don't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think about Rocky Horror this hard, Aaron. You know this. One yes, thing. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you always got to put me in these situations. <laughs> One event that I think would be like really insane that would absolutely only appeal to the diehard fans is kind of along the lines of, you know, those haunted houses where you have to like sign a waiver that like, you know, people can do whatever they want to you or whatever. Like 
imagine a completely like immersive Rocky Horror experience where, you know, it's like a very small group of people, but like you're in a car and it breaks down and then you have to like walk to the castle and then like the small audience becomes Brad and Janet and then you kind of go through the whirlwind of the movie and then there's like an actual dinner scene and then you know they're not the and then i show suck characters. the dick of a random audience member <laughs> <laughs> do they have to pay extra yeah for wait that? wait a minute i don't remember the brad riff butt fuck scene being in the movie but <laughs> i love that I, I you know if somebody if somebody could figure out how to make that work financially boy i would be there for it yeah same and on that note i think that wraps up rocky talkies 69th snack nice a uh, nice nice we want to thank tori for joining us on air this week thank you so much tori and as always we'd like to thank our writer jacob and our editor aaron from tennessee we appreciate all of your work if anyone has a question they'd like us to answer on air for whoever asks a question or some community news they'd like us to talk about or even just a cool story to share with the community, we'd love to include it in our show. Just go to our website, that's rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out our contact form to tell us all about it. If you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. You know, your repress has really awakened something in me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, would you call it a uh, repressed childhood? Oh, fuck, what did she say? Hold on, let me scroll up. Would you call it a deeply repressed childhood crush? Something like that. <laughs> I hope she never finds this. <laughs> I hope she does. It'll be a great talking point. <laughs> right, and... <clears throat> right, and <laughs> as... Oh, boy. Cagney? Is that right? Yep. Cagney. That's right. Cagney's nuts. <laughs> oh, God. I'm God. done. I quit. Do you have... Can Jacob, like, read the rest of my life? <laughs> Oops. That's nice. Nice. Uh, nice. On Friday, May 13th at 7.30 p.m., Lawtonies... Lawtonese? Lawton... <laughs> Lawton. It's pronounced Lawton, so Lawtonese? Sure. Lawtonese nuts. So, okay. You guys... Oh, well, before we do this, can I run and use the bathroom real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Nope. Oh, well, kiss on the mic. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> I'll be RP. Oh, <laughs> no man. worries. I'm gonna Don't pee worry, on John, my only mic. Tw only 20 pages left. 20 pages. It, it might have gone a little, it, it might have gotten away from me a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Just, just the, just the little bit. Where's my, oh, my food is here. Aren't we eating in like three hours? Why did you order food? I ordered food like two hours ago. <laughs> and then we recorded, so I didn't eat my food. It's fine. I'll only eat some of it.